Hello, my name is Brian Winter. I'm the editor-in-chief of America's Quarterly Magazine. I'm here with an extraordinary group, a panel of luminaries in Latin America's anti-corruption movement. I'm here with Jose Ugas, who was until recently the global uh, president of Transparency International, and is, is now a, a member of TI. With Claudio Gonzalez, who's the president and co-founder of Mexicanos Contra la Corrupción y Impunidad. And also federal judge um, Sergio Moro uh, from Brazil. So, gentlemen, it's been four years almost to the day since the raid on a gas station in Brasilia signaled the beginning of the car wash investigation. And since then, dozens of people have been jailed, not just in Brazil, but in Peru and Colombia, and other scandals in the region, including La Linea, uh, scandals involving uh, Mexican governors, have also taken place. But of late, there's been a backlash, and the Supreme Court Justice uh, Bajoso in Brazil has talked about an oligarchic pact that is engaged in a kind of backlash. And you see evidence of this in Guatemala as well. And Jose, I wanted to start with you. I mean, how, with your global vision and your view of Latin America as a whole, how would you describe the current situation of this anti-corruption? Well, it's a fact that corruption always fights back. And we've seen this historically in many other places. I mean, in the case of Peru, when we had this strong anti-corruption process against Fujimori had lasted for more than eight years, then there was a pushback with, when the change uh, of uh, uh, political will. And uh, what we are seeing now is just a reflect of that. I mean, in my same country, yesterday, we had a huge uh, <laughs> a reaction when we received the information from the statements of Barata in Brazil. Barata was the Odebrecht's man in Peru. Now he made statements saying that they had paid more than $8.5 million <coughs> to Kuczynski, the current president, to Alan Garcia, to Toledo, to the former mayor of Lima and former president Dumala. I mean, all the political class was involved. Today, the first page of a newspaper in Peru said, all of them need to go. <laughs> all of them were involved. So this is a huge corruption scheme that has had impact in 12 countries of the region and three countries of Africa. That's huge. Judge Moore, do you see signs of a backlash in Brazil? There have been reactions, but I think it's too soon to say uh, what will, will be the end of the story. I think, anyway, uh, the institutions are stronger and we will never uh, give up. We will never give up, so we will start. We will continue to do our job, despite of uh, these reactions. And uh, uh, so far, to be very honest, uh, despite of these signs of reactions, we are still there. We haven't seen anything in concrete that uh, obstruct our work. Claudio, in Mexico, I mean, there is a perception that this process is just getting started. Do you share that? Has the government been able to kind of repress this process that we've seen in other countries such as, uh, such as Brazil and Peru and Colombia and Chile? Mm. Well, first of all, thank you for having us, Brian. And it's, it's a great honor to be with Jose and Sergio in this panel. Uh, yes, I think things in Mexico are only getting started, but people are really fed up uh, with what has gone on uh, for decades and especially during the last five or six years. Uh, and uh, uh, we have started demanding change more forcefully. And uh, as Jose was saying, if you combat corruption, corruption is going to try to combat you. you know? So uh, this initial, in this initial stage, we've seen the government go uh, stay after groups that are combating corruption and impunity with espionage. They're going after us with fiscal terrorism. They're going uh, after us is the, with menaces of all kinds. And uh, we cannot give up, as Sergio says, we have to push on. We have to be very adamant that this is really uh, very harmful to our country. And uh, we have to generate the, the broad consensus needed to move things forward. These efforts you describe, have they been in a perverse way successful so far? Well, not in our particular case, because uh, we've done uh, most of our best work in terms of applied research, of uh, journalism, of communication, of litigation, after uh, it was uh, known through the New York Times, by the way, 
that there was espionage and that there was ter uh, fiscal terrorism. So no, we've uh, uh, gone forward, I would say, with even more speed after these things have happened. And the fact that they have been highlighted in the international press gives us a little bit more of defense so that we can go forward with the work. I would like to mention that there are some reasons to be optimistic, even though we are in this huge crisis of corruption. The first one is that dynamic that has impacted the region, thanks to the good work of judges like Sergio and uh, the task force uh, led by Delta and Dallagnol and uh, attorney, former Attorney General Janot. Uh, now, many of our countries are having these new young judges and prosecutors trying to make a good work because they've seen they can have social prestige and they can help to solve some of, of the worst problems of, of our country. Secondly, we've seen something that is quite new in the region, and this is people engagement. Millions of people in Brazil, we've seen thousands in Guatemala and Honduras for weeks standing there demanding the governments uh, to uh, take action against corruption. In Dominican Republic, for the first time in their history, 120,000 people went in the Green March against corruption, something similar happen in a uh, lower level in Peru and other countries. So people mobilizing against corruption is something new and we need to see what is going, uh, where is this type of movement going to, to, to lead. And the third one has to do with the private sector. Mm -hmm. Some uh, interesting new generation of entrepreneurs willing to change the things and to try to develop business with integrity. That is something quite new in the region too. I want to talk about the role of public opinion which we have talked about a lot in our previous encounters. And it has certainly been a factor that has prevented governments from you know, sabotaging the car wash probe in particular. But you get the sense in Brazil right now, especially, but also in other places, including Peru, where I was in December, that people are getting a little bit bored, frustrated, confused. I mean, I follow this for a living. And it's hard to follow sometimes because so many people have been indicted and there have been so many parties involved and the, the tentacles of the investigation have gone to other countries. Do you, I mean, Judge Moore, do you sense that, that the people are still with car wash or do you sense perhaps because of you know, these accusations of selective justice, do you think that there's a certain fatigue entering? I think there is a frustration on the uh, omissions of our government in general because until now or since the beginning the the fight against uh, corruption uh, is the uh, is a result of the work of uh, the prosecutors the police and the judges and uh, I think a lot of Brazilians me included uh, expected that the government would uh, uh, take steps to approve uh, general policies to reduce incentives and opportunities for corruption. So uh, I think f uh, people are a little frustrated because of this lack of efforts in this way. And uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we have a general election this year and uh, maybe all this frustration uh, will have an effect in the polls, in the elections. What do you see at a regional level? Uh, all the feelings you just uh, explained are there. I mean, there's a lot of mixed feelings. But I would say, again, there's a, an interesting side of the problem is that people is much more aware than 10 years before. No so in the Fujimori case, people got fed up and they were tired of seeing videos every day and a new authority taped receiving bribes. But even though we're still debating in a context of grand corruption in Peru, people now is much more aware. And we don't know in which moment this will drive to a different situation. No, and you do see polls. I mean, even with this frustration in the case of Brazil, when they ask people, do you want car wash to continue no matter what the consequence? The percentage of people who respond yes to that question is still in the 90% range. I mean, it's still quite high. So there's clearly, I mean, despite that's despite all the economic suffering that has happened over the last couple of years, which some people associate with the probe. That's absolutely true. And uh, I think that regionally talking, 
uh, what Latin America is experiencing and what people is demonstrating is, as I said before, a new element in this fight against corruption. And we will see it's, it's too soon to arrive to a conclusion, I believe. I think we're also gaining momentum in Mexico in that respect. A little bit more freedom of the press, although that's still a problem in our country. Independent outlets like Mexicanos contra la Corrupción y la Impunidad that we're doing from the citizen side, uh, investigative reporting on corruption has helped, I believe, uh, a lot to uh, bring denunciation to uh, the table here on high corruption cases. And I think uh, the internet has been very important, Twitter, Facebook, because these are so much more difficult to control. And uh, that's where people vent their frustration uh, regarding uh, corruption. It's in this election year in Mexico, uh, together with the security issues, the two most important issues. And the election is going to be decided on who people think is going to do the best job in terms of combating insecurity and also corruption and impunity. And uh, I agree with Jose that little by little, we're also starting to produce some results. No? There are the ex-governors of Veracruz and uh, Quintana Roo and Tamaulipas and Sonora who have been jailed. This is something uh, unique for Mexico and they are not the first governors from those states that took uh, the uh, money for electoral uh, issues or just for personal benefit. So uh, I think we're starting to see a little bit of momentum. People are still very frustrated, but uh, we try to highlight, listen, this was not happening 10 years ago. It's happening now. So this is a, a, an advance and uh, the national anti-corruption system that we put in place uh, uh, only a couple of years ago, of course, it's not perfect, but it's uh, a step forward. And we have to highlight the costs of corruption and impunity for our people to really uh, have this sort of uh, very broad coalition that happened in, in, in Brazil to push forward. We still don't have it in Mexico, but we're working that way. And second, these initial results, because if you only denounce corruption and people see no results, they only get more frustrated. So we have to work very hard. And of course, this we all know this is going to be a long run thing and we're going to have to be very uh, perseverant. But this is absolutely true. I think three weeks ago, former President Colom of Guatemala and 10 ministers were indicted and went to prison. Yesterday, the wife of former President Lobo in Honduras went to prison for taking half a million dollars. I mean, this is quite new. We, have, we haven't seen this it's in the region because impunity was the rule. And now impunity has started to be broken. And it started, I would say, with Fujimori, now Lavajato, and the, the ball is rolling. I think it is. And, and let me just point out, because we just had uh, Sergio uh, in Mexico, uh, because Sergio is, and his work in Lavajato and in other very important cases, uh, has not only had very specific results with really high uh, level individuals, both in politics and in the private sector. But he has become a symbol of the fight against corruption and impunity, even in Mexico. So there was huge interest to see what he's doing and the next steps we have to take in order to go that way in Mexico. Well, and one thing that you hear, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a gringo, but I, I lived, in case you couldn't tell, but, you know, I lived for five years most recently in Sao Paulo, and so I speak these days, my Spanish has sort of a light portuñol inflection. And so when I go to Mexico, people tell me, they say, you know, what we really want in Mexico is a, is a car wash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I always say, are you sure? <clears throat> you know, do you know what that implies? Do you know that the, the political disruption and the economic pain that that can bring in the short term? And they always say, yes. Now, then what I say is, look, the good news is that it's possible. The bad news is that it took 26 years between the Constitution of 1988 which made you know, the independent Ministerio Público and other things, and the appearance of the Lava Jato probe. And so you know, my question for you, Judge Morrow, is how, you know, when you look at countries that maybe, not just Mexico, but other countries that are a little bit behind the curve on this one, what, what steps, what concrete reforms are necessary for similar cases to appear? I think there's the uh, preconditions that you, you need uh, in, uh, independent justice, uh, you need independent prosecutors. We need so, you need so level, some level of independence for, uh, for the police. The police should not be just a branch of the government. I think there's preconditions 
absolutely necessary. You need also uh, a strong demand from your uh, civil society and from the public opinion against corruption. Because when you start this case against powerful politicians, uh, I'm certainly, you have this in Mexico in the time of Fujimori prosecution. They're very powerful and you need support so you could uh, avoid any attempt uh, of uh, uh, obstruction of justice. But uh, uh, let me say one thing that I think is important. It's important to break this rule of impunity. Uh, I think that in that's, uh, if you break this rule of impunity, in time you will have less corruption. But you, you, you cannot dream that uh, this will put an end on corruption. Corruption will keep happening. Uh, you have corruption here in the United States. God knows. But uh, uh, <coughs> it seems, I'm an outsider observer, that uh, you don't have so high levels of impunity as some countries are in Latin America. So maybe in Brazil, sometime, one, one day people will be frustrated about car wash uh, because some people think that it will be the end of corruption, and it will not. Okay. What you need from these lessons is to build stronger institutions so we, you will need not in the future uh, something like car wash. Uh, you have these cases solved uh, in ordinary ways by our institutions. I think this is important. Final question. The preconditions that he just listed in the region, how common? are they? I mean, how much further is there still to go? I think there's still a good path to, to, to walk. Corruption in the region is historical, is systemic, mm -hmm. and it's structural. Mm -hmm. So we need to change structures. I mean, we cannot have the illusion to think that the situation of corruption in Latin America is going to be changed by the judiciary. The judges have to do their work, and mm -hmm. the prosecutors too. But the real change, the change of structures, of cultures, of systems, has to be done on other side. It has to be done with policies, with leadership, with political will, from the government, with the people reacting, with the private sector taking mm -hmm. action mm -hmm. on the way they invest and how do they do business. So uh, the judicial part of the story is a marginal one. Of course, very relevant to end impunity and to show that Whoever commits a crime will pay for that. But the real changes have to come from our side. Claudia, I mean, well, I think in, Mexico. in Mexico's uh, uh, side, and we learned very much from uh, Sergio's experience uh, in the l uh, couple of days that he was uh, uh, during the week there in Mexico. But I, I, I agree with Jose. It's, it's really complex, and it has many facets to it. But I think one critical step that Mexico has to take at this point in time is uh, independence in prosecuting because prosecuting in Mexico is completely politicized. And if you have that state of affairs, then it's very difficult to take cases to your judiciary, whether it, they are really good or not good. They are not receiving that information. And unfortunately, our Attorney General's office is uh, under the mandate of the executive branch. And uh, they pretty much only go for those who the regime thinks are their enemies. And they will always protect their cronies. And that's a shameful uh, a state of affairs. We're trying to change it. We have to change our constitutional because I believe what the gentlemen have said, institutional building and incentives are the way to go. Uh, and it's a really complex issue. Shows that. I, think, I think we're starting to move in the, in the right direction. We know it's going to be a long haul, even an intergenerational long haul. I mean, I always go to universities in Mexico at least once or twice. I was telling Sergio every week to talk to the new generations because we know we're going to advance some, but we're going, still going to pass a, a big problem onto them and uh, they have to uh, take the staff and run with it uh, in, in the future. And it's a never ending story. It's clear to me that we are closer to the beginning of this story than we are to the end. Um, but this has been great. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you Brian.
very much.